This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. When you think back to your childhood, what was your favorite thing to do? There are lots of conversations about learning loss in the pandemic, but learning through play is as important as classroom learning. Today, where we live, we talk about the importance of play. Coming up, we hear from a play therapist about how unstructured playtime can help children heal and make sense of their world. Now, what does play look like in your home? We want to hear from you. You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Joining us now first on Zoom is Jessica Hoffman. She's Director of Adolescent Initiatives at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and Associate Research Scientist at the Yale Child Studies Center. Jessica, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So we know we're not the only animals that play. Let's start with when we, what we observe in the animal kingdom and, and how play is so important when we see young animals uh, playing with their siblings. Sure. Yeah. So that's right. Um, and I'm certainly not an expert in animal play, but I, I do know that many, many animals play and there are different theories on why, um, right? One being um, probably the most popular that it's practice, right? So we see young lion cubs wrestling and, and um, think that maybe that's practice for hunting. Um, but I think we also can't just discount the importance of fun, that play can just be for fun to let off steam, to let off energy, um, so that we can behave the other parts of the time when we have to maybe have more self-control. It's also a way to build social skills. So we see in um, dogs or cats that are playing that um, they accidentally nip too hard or are, are too rough that the other playmate will tell them that. And so we start to learn about boundaries and where that line between fun and danger is. When we look to the human child, I know when I had my first child, Jessica, I really honed in on that zero to five where they talk about a brain growth and why it's so important when children are developing to be exposed to different things and to maybe avoid too much screen time during this time. So can you talk about how play really is key to the development in the human child? Definitely, yeah. So. Um... Play is a natural activity for almost all children. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's one of those first ways that children begin to express themselves and to explore their world. And study after study show that play um, is important for, predicts, helps to develop just a host of skills. We can think about social skills like cooperation, sharing, empathy for others. Um, and also emotion skills, like beginning to learn how to cope, to adjust, to grapple with different feelings, to scary stories, or those sorts of things. Um, and there's also quite a bit of research that play relates to creative thinking. And one of my um, particular areas of interest is what we call divergent thinking, which is being able to come up with lots of ideas when posed with a problem. And so much of the work that I've done has looked at, you know, the five-year-old who's able to come up with four or five different ways to use the cardboard box is the 16-year-old who can figure out um, multiple solutions to the flat tire, right? Is the CEO who can figure out multiple solutions to the company's problem. So that, that ability starts very young. Peg wrote to us on Facebook. She writes, play is the nutrient needed now for a year flooded with stress and instability. So let's talk about how play can help us become more resilient. Sure. So certainly one way is that play is a way that children and really all of us can grapple with what's been going on to help us process or digest information. And so I think a lot of parents are seeing their kids actually play out um, quarantine or play out getting a COVID test or a COVID shot. And so you, if you see that, it, it's really just um, children trying to understand through one of the modalities that's natural to them through play, um, these things in their world that they're not, um, that are new, new information that they've got to digest and, and, and try to understand and wrap their heads around. Um, and as I mentioned before, play is also just play is fun, play is relaxing, play is a break from the rest of uh, what's going on, the stress, the isolation, grief for many people. Uh, so finding that space to tap back into your playfulness, that joy state is a really important um, balance to everything else we've got going on that's so serious. 
That certainly happened in my household and during the first few months of the pandemic, Jessica, my five-year-old daughter uh, has a, a medical, a play medical kit and she was pretending to give us <laughs> COVID shots, uh, you know, as we talked about, you know, when the vaccine would come. And I was, first I was a little bit worried about that um, as somebody who works in the news thinking maybe I'm talking about this too much around my child. But it is interesting to see how they take what they hear and how they act out certain things. Um, so not, so not something to be worried about. No, not at all. I think um, uh, play is a safe space, right? Because it's, it's pretend. So it's not the real world where you can try on different emotions, try on different endings to a story, uh, try out being different characters, right? You get to be the doctor instead of being the patient uh, when children play. And I think that helps them feel like they've got control and, and some um, mastery over these other things that feels sometimes like we're so helpless. You're hearing Jessica Hoffman here on Where We Live as we talk about the importance of play, especially in childhood. You can join us, especially if you're a parent, if you have questions about unstructured play or what, what you are observing with your child or children. We'd love to hear from you, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Jessica is the Associate Research Scientist at the Yale Child Studies Center. So can we talk more about the different types of play that we observe, starting with when children are very young, Jessica? Yeah, definitely. So there are a lot of terms out there for play. So I'll go down just kind of a few of the big buckets that I like to think about. One is functional play. And this starts very, very young when infants are just, um, you know, spinning the wheel on a car or stacking up some blocks. And they're just starting to explore their world, learn about cause and effect, right? Kind of figure those things out. And then we see children move into uh, what I study the most, which is pretend or fantasy play. And that's this, um, when you play princess, when you play the floor is lava, which is a very popular game, uh, those sorts of things. A subset of that is what we would call sociodramatic play. This is playing house, playing school, playing store, playing restaurant. It's, it involves that fantasy and pretend, but it does have some social scripts and social rules around it, right? So it's not quite as fantastical as pure fantasy play, uh, which can be good because you're learning about those rules, right? You go up to the cash register, you hand in the money, they give you the food, whatever it might be, right? So children are playing out those skills that they'll need. Um, rough and tumble play is a big one. When we think about wrestling or sword fighting or running around on the playground. And then uh, one of the other ones that's one of my favorites is games with rules. This is everything from Candyland and board games to soccer or chess. Um, and all of the things in between. When you were talking about rough and tumble play, when should a parent get involved? Because you want to also teach your children to be respectful of others and not to be so hands-on or, or pushy at times. And, and so what's normal and what's something that you think, uh, you know, where us parents should not feel bad stepping in? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that that's something where the individual, there's, there's going to be individual preference in what's too far. And this gets really back to what counts as play versus <laughs> um, work or fighting. Uh, and so play's got a couple of elements. The first one is that it's a choice. So if two children are playing rough and tumble, then both chose to be part of that. So if one child didn't choose to be part of that, then it's not play, right? And a parent should step in. The second is that it should be fun um, and so if it gets too aggressive or someone, you know, someone is no longer having fun, uh, that's not play either. And again, someone should step in. The trick here is that what makes play fun is that it's usually right on the edge of real. Um, if it's not, if it's too mundane, then it's not interesting or fun or challenging. But if it's too real, well, then now it's real and not play. Um, so I think just watching with a close eye to make sure that it was everyone involved was choosing to do it and that it still looks like it's enjoyable. Uh, over the pandemic, we think about all the conversations that parents and educators have had about what children are missing when they're not in a classroom with their peers. Uh, luckily, uh, that's uh, less of an issue now as more schools are back full time or on a hybrid schedule. But just that learning how to interact with others, I think, is always interesting because in a group of kids, I know I've noticed with my children, there's always one that's kind of the leader, right? And, and they try to dictate like what's happening and how we're going to play. And it's interesting to see how they're each learning how to interact with each other and, you know, speak up sometimes and other times just to follow. 
Yeah. So play has play in groups has a kind of natural flow of, of someone is um, deciding the, the plot or what's going to happen next at any given moment. Um, but as groups of children play together, it tends to ebb and flow who's in that lead. So, I mean, some children are more comfortable there than others. Um, but you tend to find that it changes over the course of play. Or if someone is too bossy or kind of always wants to be in charge, that eventually the group will um, push back against that. And so then, again, we see those social skills start to develop of turn taking and of listening to others and of cooperation. And what does the research say when you're observing a child playing by themselves? What is normal and what is something that you should be concerned about, Jessica? Sure. Um, so actually, I, I want to mention that one of the, um, a lot of the research on the benefits of play have actually come out of watching kids who are playing solo, who are playing by themselves. And so while we tend to think of play as a group activity or playing with a friend, there's actually quite a lot that can happen when you're playing by yourself. So for the only children out there or, you know, people who aren't able to go back to school yet and are playing at home alone, there's still quite a lot that um, is beneficial about that. And in fact, um, in some ways, you're forced to use your imagination and not be the follower of a group, right? So you're now in charge of all of the imagination, all of the leading. Uh, and so that can really um, be quite beneficial for kids to spend some time um, playing by themselves and being the one who gets to be in charge. Um, I think the um, one thing that you want to watch for is playing the same thing over and over and over and over, kind of getting stuck, in which case I think a parent can sometimes help to help a child explore other alternatives, right, by either introducing a new toy or a new idea or a new setting. You're hearing Jessica Hoffman here on Where We Live. Again, she's Associate Research Scientist at the Yale Child Study Center. As we talk about the importance of play, there's so much emphasis on thinking about play as we're growing up, uh, but um, some of the skills that we're learning as children, how that then impacts us in adult life. Jessica, can you talk about that at all? Yeah, definitely. So these are skills that we carry with us for life and that we continue to work on and improve. Um, but when we think about something like um, uh, problem solving, which comes up in play often, uh, that's something that we, we carry with us forever. It changes form as we start solving bigger <laughs> adult problems. Uh, but having the sense that you were good at that, um, which you can start to develop very early, makes a difference, right? Having confidence that you are someone who knows how to overcome things or think up new ideas or find a way around. Um, there's a self-efficacy there that benefits us as adults. Again, uh, you can join our conversation. Uh, we'd love to hear from you about how uh, the things that you played with or the games that you played as a child and, and, and what you're seeing your children play, how they're playing today. The number 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, in this pandemic year, or more than a year now, Jessica, so many families going outside, spending more time outdoors, and, and that's a good thing. And so what are you, how, what does research tell us and what have you observed uh, in your work uh, when you see children playing outside and ways to play? Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot of research outside of even, you know, play just in general, right? That getting outside is great for our health, great for our well-being. And I think this has been the year that so many people have discovered um, outdoors again, because that's, that's one of the only places we can go or be. Um, and, and one of the first places that was deemed kind of more safer, right, was to, with masks, uh, go back to the playground or have outdoor play dates. And so that is um, a big part of what people have been doing this year. One of the things that I love about outdoor play is that we get away from all those uh, toys and sort of trinkets <laughs> that are in the house. And it's, it leads to unstructured play where the children are really discovering their world. Um, and if they want to play a game, they've got to find the sticks and stones and leaves to do it. Um, they don't have all of the uh, kind of plastic from the toy store toys. And so then they really get their imaginations going. Um, they also start to discover things about their world. So it's a great way to learn about um, how water is you know, held in a container and some of these kind of 
pre-academic skills around conservation of mass or what happens when we mix mud and water together, what happens when we mix water and sand together. So they can really start to, some of the same things you would maybe learn in school, but in a more um, direct instruction memorization way, kids can learn on their own, just exploring their world. How should parents play with their children? We know our schedules are so busy and often parents, especially if they're working from home, they'll hear their child say, mom, come play with me or dad, come play with me. And what's an effective way to interact with their child where you're not going to feel guilty if you say, well, you know, I'm busy. Why don't you go play? But what does that mean exactly to your child when that often becomes the common refrain? I love this question because it's one of my favorite um, studies that I ever did was looking at what the adults do and what, how that impacts a child's play. And so we looked at um, things like prompting the child, you know, what could happen next in the story. We looked at asking questions. We looked at um, just watching and observing. We looked at playing with the child. We looked at sort of summarizing at the end, like, oh, I see you did this and this and this. And what we found with the number one thing that led to more engagement and enjoyment in the play for the child was when the adult watched Um, So you don't have to feel like a confident pretend player yourself as a parent. The thing that kids want to do is feel seen. Um, And so it doesn't mean be near them on your phone. This means actually watch, look like you're interested. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, But that that watching makes such a difference. And then second best after that was playing with them, actually getting in there and, and playing with them. But all those things around prompting, modeling, or, oh, I see you're doing this, or, oh, what are you doing now, really just ended up interrupting. Um, the child's flow state, they were in it. And then you said, oh, are you playing restaurant? And then they stopped playing to look at you and say, yes, right? So you actually ruined it. And of course it was done with good intentions, but we watched video after video and that's what we found. It's just watching, looking interested, having your child feel seen and like what you think they're doing is really interesting. Those are all helpful. Thank you, Jessica Hoffman. Again, she's Associate Research Scientist at the Yale Child Studies Center. As we talk about the importance of play, what does play like look, what does play look like in your home? We want to hear from you. You can join us 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. When children are young, parents wait for them to speak their first words. But children have already been communicating using play. We're talking about the importance of play with my guest on Zoom, Jessica Hoffman, Associate Research Scientist at the Yale Child Studies Center. And we'd love to hear from you, too. 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Jessica, we've been talking a lot about play, unstructured play, why it is important for child development. But let's talk more about toys because we are inundated with so many options out there for our children from Legos and different types of figures and dolls. But when you do your research and you're studying about uh, play, what are some of the toys that can really help children use their creativity and develop these skills? Yeah, great question. Um, So you're right, there's about a million toys out there. And um, what I look for are the toys that are not what I call a unitasker, that only do one thing, uh, right? Because those don't really inspire a lot of imagination. And once the kid uses it, uh, they tend to get bored with it quickly. So I look for those toys that can be reused over and over again. And Lego bricks is a great example, along with things like art supplies. um, And honestly, just odds and ends around the house. I have two sons, they're two and six, and we changed out all the brass knobs in our kitchen and they have had more fun pretending that those old brass knobs are leprechaun gold to (laughs) coins that they were exchanging. I mean, just who would have thought, right? Um, Other toys that we use when we're doing research, you know, you want to really inspire kids to be pretending is some human, uh, human dolls, whether it's dolls or action figures or figurines, Um, Some animals can be great. And if you really want to get specific, some predators and some prey. So some sharks and whales and, you know, so also some giraffes and zebras. Um, 
And then what I call just these ambiguous toys, I think the things that are, it's not obvious what they're supposed to be, is they can be used as whatever the child needs in that particular story that they're playing out. Um, with the, the main point being, you don't need a lot of stuff. You don't need to stock up on, you know, and spend a lot of money on all of these toys that are out there. Um, I think we've all seen the kid who was more interested in the cardboard box than the toy that came in that box. Um, and that really is true. And we know we've got plenty of cardboard boxes around, especially with uh, Amazon and those uh, short day deliveries. Uh, my colleague, Diane Orson, gifted me some those jumbo cardboard boxes in different colors that look like bricks. And those can really inspire my children for hours at a time, which is nice, Jessica. <laughs> yes, you can make a fort, you can make a tower. Um, yeah, any anything. A uh, Tess, our producer, writes, when I was a little girl, my dad was very skilled at playing Polly Pockets, and I treasure those memories. And that's really a nice memory to think about uh, when uh, you're growing up, uh, to think back to when your parent or parents uh, took the time to actually play, Jessica. Definitely, yeah. I think that memories of play as a child really can help us as adults in a lot of ways. So the first being that that, that the play experience is, is one of um, what we call a flow state, right? So you're, you're interested, you're challenged, and you kind of lose all track of time and around you sort of fades away when you're really engaged in play. And that is a state that we, I think, try to get back to in our adult lives. And having memories of what that feels like from your childhood makes it that much easier to access that again <laughs> as a grown up, whether it's in play or in something else. The other pieces around this, um, like I mentioned, the sort of beginning to build your self-efficacy. So there's a researcher, uh, Dr. Ron Bugetto, and he talks about going from saying, I like art, to I want to be an artist, to I am an artist, right, as we develop from childhood into adulthood. And it starts with that interest that I like this, I like playing, right, I want to be an actor, I am an actor. It has to start somewhere. I feel like there's also uh, societal pressures of of what your child should play with. Uh, if your child identifies as a a boy or a girl, and uh, you know if they're not playing with that that what's considered a gender specific toy, that there's something wrong. Can you talk about that and how uh, parents should approach this? Mm, yeah. So parents certainly have preferences. You know, some parents have have more preferences here than others. My take has been to. Um, provide, I, I, like I said, I have two sons, provide them with access to whatever they're interested in. So we've got baby dolls and baby strollers and things that might be considered um, girl toys or more feminine. Um, but young kids don't think that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's up to the parents to, um, to think about how we're socializing our kids to be interested in one thing or another, right? Um, uh, are boys really naturally more interested in action figures than dolls? Or is that something that they pick up along the way that they should be? And, and can we turn that around? Um, so, you know, we joke all that my, my two-year-old actually has a, a baby doll that he wears in a, um, one of those like front packs that <laughs> people carry their real infants in. And, um, you know, he's going to be a good dad. That's just as important, right? So... Um, yes, great point. Jessica Hoffman, Associate Research Scientist at the Yale Child Studies Center. As we talk about the importance of play, you can join us too, 888-720-9677, 888-720-WNPR, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. We're actually getting a lot of uh, social media comments. I wanted to take time to read a couple to you, Jessica. Kaza writes, uh, this conversation has been incredibly insightful play to develop skills and catalog situations to be used to navigate social situations. She also writes, play to learn doesn't end though with children through live action role play. Causes continue to be challenged in a safe environment. That's a great point, Kaza, thank you. And Jennifer writes on Facebook, she's the director of Kid City Children's Museum in Middletown, which is a wonderful place. Um, they've been closed since the pandemic started. And she writes, Jessica, I think the biggest loss is what you mentioned, that just observing your child at play is worthwhile. 
And Jessica or Jennifer wanted to also uh, add to this that it's important for the grown up as it is for the kids because when you watch your child at play, you realize in a deep way how much you love them and how wonderful they are. It also recharges your batteries for the hard stuff. That's an excellent point that uh, play, uh, the way we see our children, uh, how that also impacts our emotions, Jennifer, Jessica. Yeah, definitely. I think there's so much that we can gain from watching our children play. Um, You know, if if you want to know what's on their mind, right, you can watch what they're doing, what they're acting out in their play. Um, If you want to know kind of how they're doing with their friends and how they're getting along, listen, listen to the play and listen to how they're cooperating or not, how they're negotiating different situations. And certainly as adults who maybe give ourselves less time for that, um, I know I always end up with a smile on my face and, and in a better mood after watching some kids um, who don't have all those stresses on their shoulders yet, right? Just running around and having a good time. That's Jessica Hoffman, Associate Research Scientist at the Yale Child Studies Center. Again, we'd love to hear from you about how you incorporate play uh, in your household, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So let's talk about screen time, because we know there's so many apps out there and so many games that kids can play. And what have you observed in your research, Jessica, and how that impacts child development? Yeah, so screen time is a hot topic. And I think more and more what's becoming um, obvious is that it's not just sheer uh, numbers of hours that's going to be good or bad. It's it's what you're doing with that time, right? Um, especially as we see this year with so much school happening online. That is a very different quality screen time than maybe scrolling through social media or um, doing some sort of mindless game. There are tons of um, great video games and screen time, you know, iPad games and apps um, that build children's play and imagination and creativity. Um, We call these like sandbox games, things like Minecraft, um, where children are building and creating and have an older children where they can be in the in the world where you're interacting with others. that's very different than than the sort of scroll through Facebook kind of screen time that we tend to think of when we have that negative take on on what it is. Does being in front of a computer or on a tablet for too many hours, does that really impact a child's attention span? I think, again, it's going to depend on what you're doing on there. Um, so, uh, I mean, certainly there are some downsides, right? I think the ophthalmologists would tell us that we shouldn't spend too much time looking straight at a screen. Um, And of course, I think there's no substitute for in-person interaction. Um, But I think that there's also um, ways in which there are a lot of skills we build through those kinds of games. So even some of the more video game type games, uh, children are reading maps, they're collecting coins and delaying gratification to buy something else they're strategizing, they're handling um, losing or failure and having to try again. So there are, there are highlights in there. In your work at the Yale Child Studies Center, especially in this pandemic, have you been able to hold webinars uh, to help uh, people in the community learn about how to help children play, especially if they're feeling isolated? Yeah, we did. So through um, my role at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, towards the beginning of the pandemic, we hosted a webinar for educators and for parents on play and playfulness and engaging with your children at home. Um, And that's available online. But, you know, we brought up many of these points. Um, One of the questions we kept getting was around scheduling and where to find the time for play. Uh, And we really just uh, got into a conversation, honestly, about... um, well, scheduling time for play is better than no play, but also play is so spontaneous that can you really pencil it in for a half hour at, you know, at lunch? Um, and I kind of came down on the side of, well, that's that's better than not providing any time for play. Um, but really, it also can be spontaneous and anything can be can be playful, right? We can make washing the dishes as a family into a game. We can make cleaning up the playroom into a game, right? We set a 10 minute timer and then see how much we can get cleaned up, right? So we can find those moments of spontaneous play.
even in a busy, busy world. Melissa shared with us on Facebook, her grandson, who is five, lives in the south central part of the country. When they video chat, he likes to take the phone to his room to play with her. This sometimes entails him putting the phone on his big truck and running down the hallway, followed by, was that fun, Grandma? And he's more talkative during this playtime than when his mom is holding the phone. So that's a that's an important point about how we can use uh, sometimes screen time to help connect with relatives who don't live in, in nearby. Definitely, and there are actually a, there have been a number of apps coming out. The one I'm thinking of is called Together App, and it's got games. Uh, my son also loves to play them with his grandparents, who he hasn't been able to see in person. Um, and so that's another, you know, it's screen time, but it is play time as well. Um, and actually there's a, um, a professor out of Case Western Reserve University, Sandra Russ, and she's been doing quite a bit of research into um, play and play therapy over telehealth in which the children have a set of toys mailed to them. And she's got the same set of toys and she mirrors what they're doing over Zoom and they play together, even though they're apart. Uh, so it can be done. We'll be talking more about play therapy in just a few minutes here on Where We Live. Again, you can join us 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, so do you think that as a country we're getting better with understanding how important play is, especially in a child's life? And I'm wondering, are there things we can learn from our, our European uh, countries? Sure, yeah. I think the pendulum on the importance of play swings back and forth. And I'm optimistic that we're headed towards a, a deeper understanding of the importance of play and playtime and, and just unstructured time for kids. Um, it, it, like I said, it kind of goes back and forth. We got into quite an academic rigor <laughs> side of the pendulum there for a couple of decades, but I think we can learn yeah, from our European colleagues and, and actually even um, um, countries like China are headed back in the direction of unstructured time, choice time, um, and realizing that this is an important part of, of a whole child. Jessica, I started the conversation mentioning how there's so many people fixating on learning loss. And while that's important, of course, uh, when we think about uh, academics and making sure that children are meeting uh, certain skills uh, in the classroom, we're almost, uh, summer's coming. And we hear about enrichment programs, especially in districts where uh, they're falling behind. And I'm wondering, as someone who studies this, what should policymakers and educators be thinking about when they provide these programs for children? Because it is summer, they, they also need a break. Yeah, I think there's a balance here. Um, the first thing I'll say is I work with a lot of educators and the term learning loss has gotten a lot of criticism because loss would suggest something you had that you've lost, which isn't the case in our kids, right? We just didn't get as far as we typically get in a school year. Um, and so that's a, just a different frame on it. And I think you're totally right that um, while there is some, some maybe catching up to do and we don't want to uh, discount the importance of that, there's got to be time that's downtime and away time from that. Um, one of my mentors, Lisa Damore, speaks about learning as a workout. And so we think about we're asking our children to work out their brains while they're at school. But what do you do after you work out? You have a recovery day or a relaxation period. And so kids and their brains need that too. That's what, you know, some from some downtime after school should be. That's what weekends are for. And that's what the summer is for. So we've got to find ways to build that in. You're hearing Jessica Hoffman here on Where We Live, Associate Research Scientist at the Yale Child Studies Center. Again, we're talking about the importance of play coming up right after the break. More about play therapy, and we'll take your calls to 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. <laughs> This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up tomorrow, we all communicate in our daily lives, but how do languages actually work? 
tomorrow, linguist Nicole Holliday joins us, and we hope you do too. Now, today we've been talking about the importance of play. There's also play therapy. The New York Times reports that the child-centered approach started in the 1940s, but it was a U.S. psychologist, Virginia Axline, who developed and popularized play therapy through her 1964 book, Dibs in Search of Self. A play therapist based in Connecticut joins us now on Zoom, Dr. Victoria Gould, a clinical psychologist and play therapist in Simsbury. Victoria, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So tell us more about play therapy. Who is it for? You know, play therapy is for any child who comes through my doors, really, that, you know, wants to be able to express themselves in a way that's most comfortable for them. So, you know, parents bring their children to me for a variety of reasons, whether it's anxiety or, or negative emotions, temper tantrums, problems at school. And for children, play is the best way to express themselves. And so when a child comes to your office, uh, what does that mean for them? How do you interact with them? What do you watch for? You know, I usually, when they first come to my office, I'm with them and the parents, and I let the parents sort of explain why they brought their child. And then, you know, the, the parents leave, and, and I have a variety of, of toys and puppets. So there's, you know, play toys for creative play or more structured play, as in chess or shoots and ladders. And I let the child choose, and I, I follow them. You know, I, Jessica you know, talked a lot about play and, and, and a lot of what she spoke about happens here. But what's nice about the therapy experience is that when I watch a child, right, that's very empowering. And I will sometimes, you know, mirror what's going on so they feel understood and validated. And there's huge wealth of um, potential in being able to help a child then start to um, express their feelings in a way that is understood by me, right? So tell me more about your playroom, because it sounds like it'd be a fun place, Victoria. It is, you know, I, you know, children come in and, you know, one of the most important things is for myself is to be able to be silly, right? And really enter the child's world. So whether we get puppets and we start talking, you know, the child really starts to get a sense that I can speak their language. And so, you know, as they're playing with the dollhouse, I might just, um, you know, monitor what their, you know, dialogue and, and talk through what they're, they're doing. And so as they hear me talking through what they're doing, they feel understood. And it also, there are times when I might jump into the play and be able to provide a different perspective for them as they're working through an issue. How has your practice changed in the pandemic, having that um, in-person experience with a child and their parent? Well, we the practical piece is that, you know, both the child and myself have been masked. So that, you know, that takes away a little bit of sort of the nonverbals, but it's been, it's been useful for children, I think, to come in because, you know, with this pandemic, the children really um, thrive on a sense of control and predictability. And so that was taken away, whether it was now they're at home and, and they're not at school. And so being able to come in here and through the play really regain a sense of control and work on some of those anxieties that have um, been elevated at home or through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So there's a variety of reasons why a child may come see you um, for play therapy. But when I think about uh, children who've experienced extreme trauma, the importance of how play helps them heal, Victoria, can you talk about that? Yes. You know, when a child comes in and they start to express some of their feelings that maybe they haven't wanted to express out in the real world, maybe there's there's fear of reprisal from a parent or, you know, feeling misunderstood, they're able to come in and really just express those feelings openly in a safe place where they're not going to be judged. And as well, I can interject and help them rework their understanding of that, of that trauma. Mm -hmm. And the repetition of the play, you know, again, is another way that um, a child can heal from that trauma. Mm -hmm. 
For parents who may be listening and thinking maybe play therapy is something my child needs, uh, what what can you tell them, Victoria, in terms of are there, are there maybe some techniques that you use uh, in the office that they can start to have this conversation at home and, and build some trust with their, ch- their their child or children? Yes, absolutely. I, I think sometimes when parents bring their children to therapy, they're feeling stuck. They don't understand their child's feelings or they 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 see their children and they have their parenting strategies that they keep trying and they may not be um, the best match or most effective for their child. And so as I work with the child and, you know, I can understand that the temper tantrum is really the anxiety around not getting enough time with their dad who's having to take care of the, the young baby in the home, that I can then help that parent understand some of the underlying feelings and emotions that the child um, is feeling that they're not able to express with their parents, um, or as well, helping parents understand that, you know, their child likes this type of play, right, that that's what's engaging. And so then parents can start to work on that. You know, an example, I was listening to Jessica, I had parents who were looking for motivators, right? So when their child, to help their child follow through with chores or whatever they needed to do. And they said, well, you know, I guess we we like to go for walks and the child doesn't like to do that. And and so I had been talking with the child and in our play, we were dealing with fairies. And so I said, well, maybe, you know, it would be really nice for you and your child to go out and make fairy houses in the woods. And the girl lit up, the child thought that would be wonderful. So there, even just the parents thought going for a walk, but if they understand their child better, knowing that's what was going to be interesting and engaging for their child was creating fairy houses in the woods. Mm -hmm. So when we see uh, our children acting out or misbehaving, they're just communicating with us, Victoria, as a way uh, to, they need help maybe regulating their emotions. That's right. And so in therapy, you know, one of the things that I can do is help a child regulate their feelings in the therapy session, right? And then helping parents, you know, use those skills that I'm working on in the the therapy session out there. And as well, helping children, right, have a, a vocabulary, gaining a different vocabulary to be able to use with their parents so that they can replace the ten- temper tantrum with words. So I'm going to put you on the spot, Victoria, because we're talking about play and why it's so important as uh, we grow. But I'm wondering, as an adult, how do you make time for play? Um, I like to play. I, I, you know, whether it's (laughs) cleaning the dishes and singing and dancing and, um, you know, I I also like to play bananagrams. My my children are older, so we like to to engage in, in a healthy battle of bananagrams. I know we try to have game night uh, at least once a week. Uh, uh, Jessica Hoffman is still with us. Uh, How do you make time for play, Jessica? Yeah, um, we we love board games as well at our house. And uh, my kids are much younger. We do a lot of bathtub play. (laughs) We get stuck in the tub for hours on end sometimes, my two little ones. Um, So that is anything with water and being and being wet. I wanted to share a comment on Facebook. Aaron writes, I'm a single mom to three young children. I just completed my master's of science education. Congratulations, Aaron. Uh, She writes, I don't think I could have done it without my kids quietly working on their iPads. We love Minecraft. I love how it is sandbox based play. And there are many possibilities to use this in the classroom. That said, I can tell my children they need to detox from all the screen time they had and they can't wait to get back in the woods. I wanted to read that, Aaron, for Aaron's comment uh, to you, Jessica, because we had talked a little bit about this earlier about, you know, we're all trying to do the best we can and we have different strategies uh, to get the work done as well as interact with our children. But I guess there's no right or wrong. We're just trying to do our best. Yeah, that's my take. I mean, I think that this is a pandemic and, you know, multiple pandemics. <laughs> and so if you, you know, this is not a good time to, in my opinion, right, the snapshot that you take of how well you're doing and how much screen time or, you know, you're doing, um, just don't judge yourself too harshly because these are not normal circumstances. Uh, So we have to practice a lot of self-forgiveness and grace (laughs) and, and do what we can. 
Victoria, did you want to add to that? I do. I agree with Jessica. I also think that really, you know, play can happen anywhere at any time. You know, whether it's when my kids were young, I would have opera night where everything at the dinner table I said, I, I sang through opera. And so you can, you know, and it's these little snippets of quality times of play. So yes, your child may need to be on the iPad a little more so that you can get your job done, but then can you really shift and focus in on being playful, as Jessica said. I think that's mm. important. Victoria, we didn't mention this in the show, but the how some children, they rely on a security blanket or a special toy and how that can bring them comfort, something that we should still encourage. I think we probably, even as adults, have our comfort quote, blankets, right, in in different forms. And so, yes, I think that's a sense of security that um, children can have. And 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 again, with this creative play, you know, having imaginary friends or, or, or talking to that stuffy that you have. You know, I use that a lot with, with when I send children home who are having trouble with sleeping, right? You know, can you, do you have that special stuffy that you can take care of, right? So that that child feels empowered if they're afraid in their bedroom, that they're becoming, right, the caretaker for their stuffy. Mm. Uh, Jessica Hoffman, uh, you mentioned that you talk and work with educators. Are you seeing schools being more thoughtful and trying to build more play time in the school day? Children need time to rest and also to move their bodies. Yeah, I think that um, primary school educators would totally agree in overwhelming numbers about the importance of play and choice time and, and unstructured time. Um, and how much they're moving to do that is a question of larger district and, you know, uh, U.S. policies. Um, but we've seen, you know, laws, uh, um, right, that you can't take recess time away from kids as a punishment. And so I think even just in something like that, right, that's a recognition of the importance of that break in the day. Um, right? And the kids who get recess and engage in recess come back in and, and, and are be able to be more self-regulated for the rest of the school day. Um, and certainly we look at things like project-based learning when we get to upper elementary and middle school and the idea that, again, these self-directed longer-term projects where children are being playful and discovering things on their own, those memories uh, and those things that are learned through that kind of doing um, your own project and your own experimentation, those stick you know, and sometimes better than they would have through direct instruction or memorization. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation, and I think a topic that we should revisit. I want to thank Jessica Hoffman again, Director of Adolescent Initiatives at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and Associate Research Scientist at the Child Studies Center. Jessica, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Also with us, Dr. Victoria Gould, a clinical psychologist and play therapist. Victoria, thanks. Thank you for having me. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Tess Terrible produced today's show. Kat Pastor is our technical producer. We'll be back tomorrow.